This is a conversation about death. It's the one certainty we have in life, and yet it's something that very few of us talk about or even like to think about. I had a certain idea for what I might say for this introduction, but hours after recording this episode, I learned that one of my friends committed suicide about two weeks ago, and I hadn't heard about it until just yesterday. And my head is kind of reeling from that. And it's just crazy timing to just have recorded an episode and had such a deep conversation about death. And we even talked about suicide at one point in the episode. Um, I'm going to talk more about my feelings on my friend's suicide at the end of the episode. Um, But my guest today is my friend Sarah Makoda, and she is a death doula. And a death doula is someone, well, a doula is someone who gives birth and and helps assist in the birthing process and that transition um, into the world of the living. A death doula is someone who helps facilitate the trans- transition uh, for people who are dying. So we had a, a really rich and good conversation about death, and we talked a lot about different beliefs from different cultures on death. Um, I'm particularly attracted to the Tibetan Buddhist views, and we talked about um, about. Uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and things of that nature. So, hope you enjoy this episode, and um, stay tuned for some of my more personal thoughts at the end. Thanks. You and I have something in common, and that is that we're both going to die. Death is the one eventuality of life that we all face and can't escape, and yet it's always been curious to me that it's something that we don't really talk about in our society and culture. And I always wondered about this as a kid and as a teenager and as an adult, why don't we talk about death and how is it that people avoid thinking about this or confronting their own fate and eventuality that their life will end sometimes until they're deathly ill or until it really brings itself impresses itself upon them so today i wanted to talk about death and I'm joined by my guest, Sarah Makoda, and she is a death doula and death educator. And we'll hear more. She's going to tell us more about what she does. But as I understand it, um, you you help you help people with the process of dying and sort of um, help people come people who are facing their mortality. you sort of help them to come to terms with it. Is that correct? Hmm. In some ways, yeah, depending on who I've worked with in the last 10 years, it's really been a journey since I lost my mother when I was 22 and I was her more or less death midwife. Mm-hmm. And that was when I really learned the shadow aspect of death culture and how there aren't a whole lot of well-known tools to be able to navigate this conversation 
And I remember a lot of my anger and disappointment with our culture is that it almost blindsided me when she died and being with her during this process. And that's what led me to ultimately go down this rabbit hole of studying what it means to be a death doula, green burials, home funerals, holistic hospice options, grief work, Mm -hmm. and all these different ways that we can support each other in this very natural transition that we all are going to face Mm -hmm. and acknowledge that there are so many pieces to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot to explore and I'm sure we'll, we'll go down many different channels, but there's a lot that I want to talk about in this conversation regarding, um, how we, how we treat, death in this culture, um, some of the aspects we ignore and, um, some of the different ways that other cultures treat death. Great. Um, but, but as we start, I'd like to just hear more about your history and just introduce the audience to, um, who you are and kind of your, cause you have a unique perspective on death, having worked with it more closely than I'm sure the vast majority of people think the vast majority of people really don't even think about it at all, especially us young, you know, Mm -hmm. younger people. So, um, take us through like your journey into, into just getting into this arena. And, um, you mentioned that it started with your, your mother's death Mm -hmm. when you were 22. Mm -hmm. Um, how, yeah, t- uh, t- tell us a little bit about that. And um, was that um, a, a pretty sudden occurrence from, uh, like, how, yeah, just how did that come about? Mm-hmm. So I guess it, it started before my mom. I think it really started when I was five and I remember my great grandmother died and I have this very distinct memory of them all going to the funeral and me not being brought there. Hmm. And then growing up, I did have a lot of exposure to death. Uh, my aunt and my uncle passed away when within one year of each other and my grandmother a couple of years later. And I just remember death was really present and being a teenager, not really understanding one what happens to us when we die and two just feeling this void this gaping just like void and and like how how do we acknowledge that and how do we move through that in in a better way mm-hmm. and Also, death death is just happening on a continual space, continual basis, like in in nature, mm-hmm. cycles, the moon cycle. You know, death is constantly a part of our lives, and we don't we don't celebrate it as much as we should. And that's another thing that I've really learned is that on one hand, we we really need to honor the passage as this beautiful, beautiful thing that evokes grief and terror in our own questioning of our of our lives and then on the other hand we have this beautiful infinite like where the fuck do we go Mm. yeah it's this incredible mystery and um, we're we're just all on this planet wandering around uh texting each other and going to our jobs and Mm -hmm. with our families and at the end of it all is this great unknown. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, there, there's many different spiritual traditions or even atheists who believe that there's nothing, but it's, it is this great mystery. It's Mm -hmm. kind of wild that we all, we're all going to enter into that with, you know, yeah, maybe some set of beliefs that we, hold on to in life that brings us comfort in life. But really once we cross that barrier, uh, you know, who, who really knows? Right. Yeah. It's actually really timely to do this podcast because we're about to be in the day of the dead portal 
All Hallows Eve. Oh yeah. Portal. And it is around this time that I start to pick up a little bit more of spirits who have passed. And to go back to your initial question, I mean, my, I, my story is long and I just feel like every death that I've had to experience has contributed into this deeper inquiry of, of what is it all about. Mm. And I feel like the more that I've really faced what is death, like all the different pieces, all the different components, uh, it's really allowed me to more fully be involved with life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you been present um, while somebody died? Like um, e- either like been around them for a period of time while they were dying? And um, could you feel them sort of transitioning? Mm-hmm. And have you been present for someone's actual death, the moment of death? Yeah. So I took care of my mother for the six months before she left her body and that was a huge honor and one of the hardest periods of my life to witness my best friend my mom lose all capability Mm. and she also had some complications in the beginning of that she had she had cancer when I was two years old went into remission for 18 came back essentially is bone cancer and I mean cancer is a whole other that could be a whole podcast Mm -hmm. just like how cancer affects the body and the soul and she didn't want to talk about the fact she was dying Mm -hmm. and that was one of the hardest things for me because I tried Mm -hmm. and till her deathbed (laughs) she was a Taurus She's very stubborn. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She did not want to leave. She didn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we played all the beautiful music. We lit candles. We were, and I was, I was remember being terrified of what was going to happen. And I also remember being told that it's imperative to tell the person who is dying that it's okay to leave. Mm -hmm. Now, was she, was she conscious she was for... really high on morphine. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people who are dying and are under hospice care, it's 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 about reducing the pain. Mm. And and I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing. I've never been dying before on a deathbed. I, you know, I don't know if I would personally want that. And it's also brought up the questioning of like, how does that affect the release of DMT when someone dies? Or how yeah. does that affect the clear one-sided focus of, of where the soul wants to go? Mm, totally. Yeah. My intuitive feeling for myself is that I would not want to be sedated. I would. Be- well, mostly because I don't know, right. you know, I don't, I don't. And obviously when you get to that point, maybe <clears throat> you're not able to communicate. Um, you know, maybe you're not conscious enough to communicate to people what you want or don't want. Mm-hmm. But, And th- that's why it's so important to have a death doula or to even have a guided conversation with your family. Mm beforehand beforehand when you're healthy yeah you know i've been thinking i mean i think about death periodically not not all the time but throughout my life i've thought about it i've just had periods of time thinking about it and Mm -hmm. um i actually want to have a conversation with my family when i see them over thanksgiving and just tell them my wishes you know be, I'm I'm a young man. I don't plan on dying anytime soon, but you never know. Right. And yeah, I want to tell them these things of just you know, if something happens to me, what I what what my wishes are. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to be sedated. I wouldn't want to be. Well, I don't know. I guess I need to think about about it more deeply. Right. Of actually, what I actually do want, but. Mm-hmm. Or the do not resuscitate. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think about how the brain, the brain releases DMT 
when we die, right. which if you, I mean, I've talked about it before in other episodes, but DMT is a psychedelic chemical that our own brain makes. It's also found all across nature. Um, it's perhaps the most psychedelic compound that we know of. And um, our brain produces it, and we don't exactly know why, um, but it's it's released, we think it's released in small amounts when we dream, and it may be responsible for the dream state, at least in part. And, but the biggest release of DMT is when we're born and when we die. And why is that? Well, you know, science, we still don't recognize the existence of a soul. Um, but I feel like there is, based on experiences that I've had mm -hmm. psychedelic experiences or otherwise. And, um, yeah, my, my intuitive thought is like, well, perhaps this is, this is the, the way that the, the soul transitions out of the body. I feel like there, there's a death process that happens where the soul is released from the body and per, and perhaps there's a physiological process that takes place while someone is dying and perhaps even continues to take place after death, that the body, perhaps the body is still doing something even after your heart stops beating and your mm -hmm. brain activity stops, but that there, there may be some transitionary period. Um, so that why I bring this up is I, I think about, I'm like, well, if I die, I want my body to stay around long enough for if there is an after death process that takes place, I want to have the time for that to unfold. I don't want to be like cremated within 24 hours or something like mm. that, you know, like mm -hmm. let, let that kind of like natural process unfold for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different cultures uh, approach the, the death care in a really different way, you know, and I, traditional Irish culture it was believed that someone wanted to sit by the bedside for three days mm -hmm. and just be with the body or sitting Shiva in Jewish tradition or even in my home funeral education having the the corpse the body be present in the home for three days at max because you can use dry ice and that's how you ensure the freshness mm. and it really allows people to start their grieving process because when they see the person isn't there in their body, they can somatically register, oh, this person is gone. Mm. And I th think because death brings up so much stuff for us, the tendency is to get, that, get the body out of here. And mm. that was actually one regret that came up for me when I was in my death doula training was the sadness that I didn't know that I could take the time with my mother's body mm. and wash her face and just be, just be with her. And it wasn't so much of, Oh, I believed that subtle layers, energetic layers of her body were coming. Cause that, that's, that's another belief is that mm -hmm. it takes time for these different energetic bodies to be released. Mm -hmm. And in Tibetan tradition, you know, there's also, the bardo state mm -hmm. and tibetan funerals are awesome i would love to go to one of mm -hmm. those yeah yeah um yeah the tibetans i i think that tibetans have the most fascinating perspective on death and um i'm not ultra knowledgeable about it but i know a little bit mm -hmm. i think a lot of people have probably <laughs> heard of the tibetan book of the dead also called the tibetan book of living and dying and it was written uh, well over a thousand years ago. I'm not exactly sure how long, but it it describes what happens to us after we die. And the part where I'm not ultra knowledgeable is how they came to know this. But I know that um, part of what Tibetan monks do, like part of their training is um, to be more conscious of their internal state 
in the waking experience, but also they're, they're training to, um, retain consciousness as they die Mm -hmm. or to kind of reawaken back into awareness after the death state. And, uh, you mentioned the Bardo state. And so what they describe is that they're, they're, is a multi-stage process that happens to the soul after we die. And they talk about how the body vehicle that the body kind of grounds our spirit and our mind, like our, our senses and and actually being in a form um, grounds our kind of our consciousness into a certain state. And that, when we die and we become liberated from the body, that the state of our mind and our emotions manifest into um, somewhat of like a dreamlike state maybe, where like just think about when you're dreaming and it's a completely convincing reality. Um, it's full it seems like you're fully there even though this is, and that this is your like mind become manifest hmm. and so they talk about death more or less as kind of an extended dream state that you just your mind is manifesting itself into what is essentially an illusion but that is ultra convincing hmm. and um, so what the monks are training to do is to um, awaken to the, their true nature and to what they say is that upon realization of the illusion, liberation is instantaneous. Mm. And so as soon as you realize you're dreaming, you become lucid, you realize that you're in the death state that you, you can awaken and direct your experience more consciously. Uh, which I think is pretty (laughs) fascinating and who knows how they figured this out. Um, but those guys are onto some pretty, (laughs) um, I mean, yeah, they're an order that's been around for thousands of years and they have some pretty incredible teachings. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of inclined to believe, to listen at least Mm -hmm. not necessarily believe, but Mm -hmm. explore explore their knowledge and wisdom. Absolutely. My mind is kind of blown just even thinking about. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, um, they also, they believe in reincarnation and this is, this is a form of Buddhism. This Tibetan Buddhism that they, and there's different forms of Buddhism, but, um, all Buddhists, as far as I know, believe in reincarnation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so the Tibetans say that after you die, there's a period of time, they say 49 days between death and reincarnation. And that, um, oh yeah, so we were talking about Tibetan funerals. So what mm-hmm. what they do, what the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, is um, they will sit by the body um, as someone is dying and then after they've died and they say that a person is very sensitive to sound at that time and they can hear you even though they're unconscious or even though they're dead, um, that their spirit is kind of still lingering around and that they can, um, experience a state of confusion uh, or even sadness or sorrow or all kinds of things. And all of those emotions in my mind can manifest as I previously described. So they sit by their bedside and they read the Tibetan book of the dead. And more or less what they're saying is, um, they're, they're, they're telling them like, um, you're dead. Like you, you have died. Um, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, um, they guide the wayward spirit to help them, um, 
through the bardos and to to help them to remind them um of where they are Mm -hmm. so that they're not just in a state of unconscious confusion and fear Mm -hmm. and the idea is that um the more the lighter that you are that your spirit is and the more conscious your spirit is um, the more consciously you will be able to choose your next reincarnation Mm -hmm. because they describe a state of discomfort of being disembodied and that you can go, you can go anywhere. You can fly through mountains, visit people, go to any part of the cosmos, but that there's no rest. You, there's no rest in any of these places and that eventually the spirit will seek a form to, to embody again, um, as, um, a sanctuary from this endless wandering and that a spirit that's in a state of fear will just can be inclined to just go into the next available form. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before. Yeah. But that, um, if you are more conscious then you can actually choose which form to go into and um, hopefully choose like a, a better life or choose to go into a human form rather than an animal form or, which is also dependent, I believe on the laws of karma. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's probably a, a dance I don't know. between dance <laughs> between the both. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I don't really know enough about that, but yeah, they do. They do talk about how karma affects um, one's one's next life. Mm-hmm. So, and perhaps that even just has to do with the the lightness of the spirit, or or the density of the spirit, mm-hmm. like that um, the deeds that we've committed, either positive deeds or negative deeds, um, uh, weigh on the soul or lift the soul. Mm-hmm. And a soul that's burdened by guilt, um, yeah, is going to be more inclined to experience heavier states of their own consciousness manifest uh, after the death state. So, sounds like an ayahuasca journey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does. Um, it kind of also reminds me of just being present with someone who is passing and with the body afterwards also reminds me of the shamanic practice called psycho pumping Mm. and it's basically working with a soul who is crossed over and is energetically in in the in-between and more or less lost you Mm. know for instance this is done with people who have had tragic and sudden deaths or possibly suicide and it's or an overdose and it's really focusing on certain prayers or practices or offerings to help the soul get where it needs to go and be released from the confusion or like cling to this realm Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's it called psycho pumping psycho pumping interesting yeah, there's, there's definitely, um, um, I feel like shamanism gets more at these sort of subconscious underworld type realms, um, than maybe anything else that I've experienced Mm -hmm. that there, and shamanic experiences can be super light and liberated, but they can also bring you into sort of bardo like states where, you can enter a visionary state, which is more or less, more or less your mind manifest. Like, um, I've been there several times where I'm not really in my body. Like I can, can go back to my body if I want to, I'm not like completely disconnected, but my mind will just wander, but more than just kind of a daydream wandering, like it actually, I sort of enter into a semi-waking dream. Yeah, (laughs) which sometimes is really cool, sometimes can be scary, depending on where 
where you're at at that point, where I'm at at that point in my life and just what's going on, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, then there is something to be said for that, whether you're Tibetan Buddhist or just an average person, just having something to focus on while you're going through this transition. I think the tendency is to really hyper focus on the fear, yeah, and the unknown. Mm-hmm. And it's cool. Maps has been doing a lot of research with psychedelic mushrooms mm-hmm. and people who have cancer and have terminal illness and mm. the research has shown that even smaller doses have really helped people face mortality and it's just it's cool to know that we have mm. these different options when fear does show up mm-hmm. around our relationship to death mm-hmm and I've always thought of psychedelics as a form of mental or spiritual weightlifting. Like it gives us an opportunity to, to tap into deeper states that um, maybe we don't experience normally or that maybe we avoid normally. Yeah, just really a deep consideration of death and our own mortality is mm-hmm. generally something that people avoid. Mm-hmm but there's something about the psychedelic experience that can bring us into contact with our own depth in that way. And yeah, I I see it as a form of spiritual weightlifting. It's like training. Like Mm -hmm. I come out of it with a greater sense, like I come out of it with more personal confidence in a way because I've been through this journey and it's, can be somewhat difficult and it can challenge me to face up to, to parts of myself that are uncomfortable or parts of reality that are uncomfortable. And it gives me the opportunity to, um, prevail Mm -hmm. and to find a deeper sense of strength in order to come to terms with the, the experience that I'm having during the psychedelic journey. And Um, I know that's the case for a lot of people. You can come out just feeling like, like when you go through a deep journey and sometimes people even have somewhat of a death experience, especially with ayahuasca, but any um, psychedelic or shamanic experience can, you can um, have a death experience or uh, an ego death experience. And I've never had the full, the full ego death experience myself. But a lot of people who have say that like coming up to that threshold of it, they experience a lot of fear, but they go through that portal and out the other side. And um, um, a lot of people kind of like actually lose a fear of death or gain an acceptance of death more like it. (laughs) Yeah, I would say in my own experience that I had a couple times where I died. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Do tell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember this one particular time really feeling that full that full death with everything that that was and I just remember like looking at the light and going towards the light and looking at my body and seeing my body decompose physically Mm. and I also had a journey where I was on my deathbed as as a very old grandmother with grandchildren Mm. around me and whether what what really is happening in those realms I do not know I am really grateful, though, that I had the opportunity to face death in my own way. And I don't want to say that I'm still, I'm like, have no fear of it. That, sure. that would be lying. Mm-hmm. I do know, though, that it's 
really important for me to face just face it yeah face it and embrace it and it also doesn't have to be so morbid and serious you know Mm -hmm. i i have this joke that i want to um be a funeral director and bring the fun back in funerals Mm. you know Mm -hmm. because we it is a celebration Mm. it should be a celebration it should be a both and it should be a time where we grieve the loss and also celebrate the um, tremendous contributions that the soul has brought Mm. to this world and Mm. be a way of helping that soul pass on where they Mm. need to go Mm mm-hmm mm-hmm there's a cool saying um, that I enjoy, and it's when you're born, you cry, and the world rejoices. And when you die, the world cries, and you rejoice mm. because you're you're liberated, you yeah. know. And um, yeah, but we don't. Sure, you know, there is a grief process that occurs for a lot of people. But yeah, I agree. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be this, um, this morbid thing. And um, I think it for, well, yeah, like I've always thought of funerals. Funerals are for the, the, the living. Mm -hmm. Maybe for the, the dead person as well, but like they serve as um, to help people with their their grief and to come to terms with that loss and to come together. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain, there's a certain magnitude present at um, a funeral or a wake. And I think also it's difficult for a lot of us to just in this society and culture to feel our emotions. Um, for all of us, but I think especially men and there's something it's, it's easier for me to get in touch with my emotions when I'm in the presence of other people who are like, Mm -hmm. it's sort of, there's a permission there when Mm -hmm. like other people are, are, are crying. And, um, I actually just went to, I don't know. I I don't know if it would be called awake, but a uh, friend of a friend committed suicide recently and jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, it was a big surprise to a lot of her friends. They didn't know that she was really suffering or even considering taking such an action. So it was a huge shock to a lot of people. And um, I went to... Um, I, I, I don't even really know what a wake actually is, but... Um, it was just basically a gathering, um, for people to come together and, um, yeah, share about their experience with the person. And anyhow, I went, I went to it in support. I didn't know the girl, but I went in support of a a friend who did. And I felt very emotional. I didn't even know this person, but there, but just the, the magnitude of grief that was present, um, brought me into that state Mm -hmm. myself yeah Mm. and i think that's actually what is what is needed is for us to have safe spaces where we can be together and feel that grief and especially for the situation because it was particularly traumatic for a lot of individuals Uh, there is there is this remembrance of being together and and feeling our feelings you know one of the traditions i've learned from the um the dagara tribe in burkina faso they believe that grief rituals are just as important as their praise rituals as their gratitude rituals they really believe that both are needed within a society or within a community to maintain the health and wellness of their people Mm. And they really acknowledge that grief works like water. You know, if, if you don't let it flow, it becomes stagnant. And that's where dis- disease mm. happens when mm. we're not able to actually fully express that, that well mm-hmm. of grief. Mm-hmm. So it is beautiful that 
people were able to respond and come together and grieve together. Mm. And it's a process, you know, it's not, it doesn't, grief is also a very feral emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it hits you when you're driving on the 12. I know that's happened to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And all of a sudden I'm just like screaming, crying in the car. And it's like, whoa, I thought I, thought I grieved that years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible emotion that I, I suffered with depression up until, and I had done this death doula training and was doing my best to really penetrate the the death world and get more acquainted with it. But it wasn't until I went to my first grief ritual with Francis Weller, who studied with the Dagra tradition, that something really started to shift. Like the, the, the depression was really a metabolized grief for Mm. me. Related to your mother's death or related to everything, 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 sure. everything. Mm-hmm. you know, I, I definitely used to take on a lot more, be, be more affected by what was going on in the world. I would feel it in a really deep way mm-hmm. and empathically. And, yeah. Empathically. Yeah. And, you know, I have, I've had some particular big bumps in the road and it's it's been really beautiful just being on that process of of learning how to feel my feelings mm. and you're right it's it's not hugely supported in our yeah. culture so knowing that we have resources and, and tools and ways of seeing each other in that space have been hugely liberating mm. and i would say that is a, a big intention that i have in my life is to create safe spaces for people to feel their feelings yeah that's yeah. beautiful i mean we like we are a country that is ha- is in the midst of a mental health epidemic mm-hmm. truly i mean i don't know the actual numbers but a large percentage of americans are on antidepressants or medicated in some way and yeah i think there's there's a lot w- we have a ways to go to understanding how to be healthier mentally and emotionally. And I think that is a key, key part is that um, we're not really, we're not given permission in society. It's not socially acceptable. Becoming more and more, I think I've noticed um, progress just in my own short life. I think we're coming along, but we still have a ways to go to where it's socially acceptable to feel our feelings or, and even for us to allow ourselves to feel our feelings in private, you know, because I think, um, we can take on a lot of these attitudes and shame and, um, about our own emotional state when we're children and we're, we're we're shamed for feeling our feelings or crying. And that becomes like an internalized attitude that just stays with us even when we're alone Mm -hmm. and there's no one there to uh judge or belittle us it's like that voice is still inside of us Mm -hmm. judging and belittling ourselves Mm -hmm. but i think it's become clear to me through yeah just doing a lot of inner work that um that's that's one of the keys to a healthier mental state is um just giving myself permission to feel what I'm actually feeling and to um, take the time to create a space to actually feel that, you know, to put aside all the distractions, stop running away and just sit and feel. And it's really hard. I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. a lot of times, Um, but it's super valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and all the better if, you know, you know other people that can support you in that or if there is a safe space or... Um, or seeking professional health, help, help. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot of unnecessary stigma around going to a therapist. Definitely. You know, and, and I I've, I've personally couldn't suggest that more. Yeah. If if there's even the smallest inkling of like, oh, I need some support or assistance. And that's that's a thing. We're so trained to be independent. Yeah. And hold this on our own. And what I've learned is that like we can't. 
we shouldn't we don't need to yeah it's not necessary it's not necessary and also right. i've learned that grief really does need to be witnessed whether it's by yourself or by your community or even the land like even even going and being with the ocean having a good cry you know it is being witnessed mm. or even by that soul who who crosses over i love this uh, i loved learning that in the Dagara tradition, they believe that the tears are what also like help someone cross over to where they need to go. That it's like important for people to grieve for these other ancestors mm. to help them go where they need to go. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. And that's not to say to get stuck in the grief or to get stuck in sure. the wallowing. You know, there are all these different levels of mental health and so just really staying attuned and learning more about yourself and being aware of it's 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 full-time work for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i think that that um what you said about therapy is really poignant and important i myself had a stigma against therapy and even as i was releasing that stigma and recognizing oh okay that's an okay thing to do that's a healthy supportive thing to do um because i've struggled with depression a lot myself mm -hmm. but i still kind of had like like a, i guess a level of pride really in hindsight of like well yeah therapy is like a good thing to do but i don't need you know, I'm not that far gone that I need to, you know, I'm like, yeah, I had this pride of like, well, I, I, I can, I can handle this on my own, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think maybe, yeah, there still, there still was that kind of like shame associated with like, well, if I go to a therapist, that means I'm really fucked up. That means I'm really <laughs> fucked up or I'm crazy or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's like, I can't, that means that I can't hold it together for myself or something like that, you know, but it doesn't have to be that like an admission of weakness, like, oh, I'm too weak to handle this on my own. You know. Well, again, I, I think men have it particularly hard when they seek help because mm. for that it says nothing. If anything, a real man knows when they need help. Sure. Get some help. We all need help. We yeah. all need help. Exactly. We're not independent. We are yeah. interdependent. We, we really, especially when it comes to these bigger topics like death and birth and raising children and caring for the sick and the elderly it, there is a need to in in my personal opinion to show up in, in a greater way mm -hmm. than what we're doing because the way we're doing it it's we've privatized death <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's a billion dollar industry yeah and it shouldn't be that way mm-hmm so um, tell me more about how you create safe spaces for, like, I know that you've put on grief rituals before. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could tell me about that or some of the other things that you do to create a space to um, facilitate, yeah, just like opening or emotional flow for people. Um, what does that kind of, what does that look like? And then like the, the sort of structure of the event and quality of guidance that you offer. Mm -hmm. And then um, what are some of the experiences that people have within that? So I became inspired to host a grief ritual, co-host a grief ritual after I started attending them more regularly and just started to really track personal growth within myself and also this particular tradition that I learned from, it's very much about working with the ancestors and not in a woo way, it sounds a little woo, but I noticed that as soon as I started working with this tradition, deep-seated patterns that I've been carrying started to shift on these more subtle layers and I think it was it was it was actually after Trump got elected and after the ghost ship fires and it was I felt really called to help 
go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, because there's people that, that, um, listen to this from all over the place. The mm-hmm. ghost ship fire was, um, a warehouse. Well, it was a fire that happened at a warehouse party in Oakland. And, um, this very crowded artistic space that, um, the, the floor layout was kind of a maze and this fire broke out and spread very quickly. And, um, smoke filled up the whole place and a lot of people couldn't get out and I think like 30 people died or something like that mm-hmm. right and it was this big yeah this big event in the sort of artistic community in the bay area mm-hmm. so but go on just wanted to describe mm-hmm. the context of that event thank you yeah it was basically tuning into the needs of the community and that's that's what this work I'm I'm learning that it's very much about what what is needed. It's not about m- me or it, it, even the tradition. It's really about showing up for when people need to come together and grieve. And so that particular grief ritual, we I was working with one of my mentors, and we did it in the more traditional traditional way. So. Uh, Sabanfu Somme is uh, my mentor's teacher, and she and Meladoma Somme brought this tradition from Burkina Faso to the U.S., and they literally said this is a gift to the Western people. We noticed you guys don't cry at funerals. You guys were all black. Like, you're just so disconnected from, like, the juice and beauty that death and grief work has, and so they they trained and brought that tradition, and one of my teachers studied with Sabanfu, and so under her guidance, we did more of the traditional uh, set up three different altars, the, the main altar being the grief altar, and there's a threshold, and the village or the community is singing the song that apparently is so old, the people have forgotten the meaning of it. Hmm. But it's incredible because once you start singing the song, I swear something happens where you just drop in and you feel like you're in that liminal ritual space. And there's a threshold where the village is singing the song and there's two gatekeepers. And then when somebody goes, crosses the threshold to kneel or sit at the altar where they grieve, someone else is behind them, not touching them unless that's requested, but there's more or less somebody who's just sitting behind the person grieving at the altar. And that's really symbolic of you don't hold this alone. Mm -hmm. someone's here for you grief is only going to really move if it's witnessed and then I've had some experiences at the grief altar where very similar to like sitting in ceremony where I'm hearing ancestors and I'm hearing messages and I'm almost interfacing with the spirit realm through this ritual Mm. and it's just a beautiful tradition that this indigenous community has practiced and still does practice Mm. and so that was that was a couple years yeah that was a couple years ago and then we did one after the fires in sonoma county Mm -hmm. and that was also you know based on the need of the community the huge traumatic fire had stirred up a lot Mm -hmm. and a lot of people lost their homes and their jobs and Mm -hmm. And that was really beautiful to provide that last year. Mm-hmm. And since then, I have more or less been flexible again to like what what needs are there. And so when I was at the Envision Festival in Costa Rica this past year, I gave a talk on grief work and how it's needed in the festival community. And that was a particularly interesting time for me because someone ended up dying at the festival Mm -hmm. uh, from an overdose on Sunday and my talk was on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And it hit me in a way that was a bit discouraging. (laughs) How so? Because I... 
I remember the ambulance taking the body out and everyone collectively was just didn't know what had happened and there was no announcement and Envision is a small enough gathering that they could have done some kind of moment of silence or announcement and I tried to speak to the producers of the event and tried talking to medical and I definitely was met with an energy of kind of like it's not your business we have to protect this information for the family which I completely understand and I understand that we're all learning how to deal with death and we all have a different way of doing that Mm -hmm. but I just remember having to grieve alone and mm. thank God I had a couple people there, but I, and I didn't even know this man who died, but I, I felt it so fully just like, wow, we lost a 32 year old mm. from a drug overdose at this transformational festival, mm-hmm. quote unquote. You know, and what, so what happens when somebody actually does transition at one of these things? You know, where were the elders? Mm-hmm. And thank goodness Zendo was there zendo is a group that goes to different festivals like burning man or lightning in a bottle or you know who are there to support people who are having hard psychedelic trips or even having a hard time so thank goodness zendo was there because a bunch of people went to them who had witnessed this man drown witnessed him being resuscit trying to resuscitate him and no luck and so he dr- he drowned. So he overdosed he was, and drowned. Uh huh. And then, w- washed. You know, the the body came up on shore, and they were trying to resuscitate him, which is kind of a, was a bit aggressive and doing everything they could. And then, mm. an ambulance removed the body from the site. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was that was Sunday morning, and Sunday it just like party keep kept going. And how, <laughs> like, how aware would you say were people? Was it like something that people were peripherally aware of, but they didn't know what was going on and they just went on with their thing? Or was, were people actively aware and they just kind of like actively ignored it? I would say both. Yeah. You know, about 50 people were on the beach when that happened. Mm-hmm. And I happened to meet and talk to quite a few of those people following and a lot of those people needed they needed support and I'm really grateful that I did come across multiple of those people because I just was able to cry with them hold space and this was that was the day after this had happened because the initial day I actually felt very little collective acknowledgement about what had happened Mm -hmm. i very much felt like people were did not want to acknowledge it Mm. sure i well i can imagine perhaps a state of confusion or just well yeah I, i think that death is so removed from our daily experience or our daily thought process that when we are brought into contact with it in an unexpected fashion, especially in like a celebratory context, like a festival, Mm -hmm. I imagine there's, I would just imagine for myself, there would be like, you know, not wouldn't exactly know what to do with that Mm -hmm. immediately. You know, there's, maybe not a state of shock, maybe for some who witnessed it or maybe even those who didn't, but yeah, there's, it's just, wow. You, you're you unexpectedly brought into an experience of high magnitude, you know, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. And everyone copes with that in a different way. And yeah, I think most of us uh, don't know how to quite cope with that. Yeah, I mean, I have experience with death and it, it was really hard for me to quote unquote cope with it. Mm. I think I was really looking for more of a conversation with the producers or people who were in charge and was met with, yeah, a lot of resistance. And it was also a good lesson because I did end up turning to people that I was with and had conversations with other people who had witnessed it and 
maybe that's just where that work is, is really through individual conversations and Mm. just bringing the conversation more into light. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, I mean, at Burning Man, I think that's a perfect example of how, how grief is actually really welcomed and they've created a structure. It's a non dogmatic, just like structure that holds. Yeah. The temple. Yeah. The temple. Yeah. Well, as I understand it, the temple at Burning Man has, it wasn't original. That wasn't the original intention of the temple. Like the temple existed, um, longer than like it, it was around for a while. And then just over time, um, it's become, it has become a place where people, there's like a, uh, somewhat of a pilgrimage for, um, burners, um, uh, people who have lost someone during that year, they'll, they'll make a visit to this, the temple and often make a shrine or write a note on the wooden wall. There's like Sharpies all over the temple for people to just, um, write messages. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of processing of grief that does happen there. And it's an interesting space, um, emotional space. Sometimes it's very solemn. It's, it's silent and somber. Uh, other times it's celebratory, but there's, there's always a powerful kind of palpable emotional state at the Burning Man temple. But as I understand it, um, that, it, that's just something that has kind of evolved through the Burning Man culture is to utilize that space mm-hmm. in that way. Um, Again, because there's, there's, a, there's need. a need. There's a need. Yeah. That's, that's why that emerged in that way. Yeah. And it's funny because when I gave, when I gave this talk, I kind of forgot about the temple mm. at Burning Man. When I gave this talk at Envision mm-hmm. and the temple is this really beautiful example mm. of how, culturally speaking we have shown up in some way so you know Mm. celebrate that Mm -hmm. definitely you know but that space at this festival that is built out of the dust and returns (laughs) to the dust um because it's a leave no trace event which means that um every single scrap of uh everything like even you know, every piece of confetti, they like comb the dust after Burning Man to completely return the desert to, you know, so that all that's left is like tire tracks, which will blow away in the wind Mm -hmm. in a few days. Um, And so Burning Man is completely built from nothing. But the, this space at this festival, um, yeah, I think, it, it does, well, the fact that the temple turned into that does demonstrate a need for a space like that, but it also highlights the fact that we don't have many spaces mm-hmm. like that, that when people go to Burning Man, they utilize that space in that way, and they are able to process their grief in a deeper way than you know, maybe that person passed some time ago. Burning Man only happens once per year. So at what point in the year did the person pass on? Um, or do do people do that year after year? And that's kind of how they can track their relationship with the passage of that person. You know, Could be. Yeah, right. To, yeah, as almost like um, an emotional gravestone or something mm-hmm. like that to go back and, and kind of tune in with that. Right. But. But yeah, it's valuable and important. I'm glad that that space exists. And it also does highlight to me that that space does may not exist anywhere else for some people, you know, that they don't have, they don't have that quality of support and and space that the temple provides out there in the remote black rock desert. Um, And yeah, perhaps it's a good, point to like talk about I'm just curious like how how is it that our culture has avoided talking about death and thinking about death I mean 
death has been around as long as life has been around. Mm -hmm. So how have, how have we made it into this time where we're talking into microphones and people are watching us on the internet, but we still haven't really come to terms with death. Like that's fascinating in a way Mm -hmm. that culturally, societally, we've avoided coming to terms with this. And yet every single person will die. Every one of us will die. It's, um, it's kind of amazing, (laughs) miraculous. (laughs) Um, so that's something to that we can explore. Um, what is it about death that is so that causes us to avoid it? You know, like what is it about our mortality and the unknown? Like why do we fear death? I mean, what what is there to fear? Hmm. What do you think? Hmm. I know it's a huge question, but go wherever you you yeah. like with it. Again, I, I, well, one, death puts our ego directly in danger, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I think the way that everything else is kind of set up for us, especially, I don't want to speak for all cultures. I think some cultures have a much better relationship with mm-hmm. death. You know, for instance, in India, you go to the burning ghats and there's this in Varanasi where the, the bodies are burnt on the riverbanks of the, the Ganges River and there's a cultural and community understanding of this is part of life. This is what we're doing. This is how we grieve mm-hmm. and we're all doing it together side by side. Strangers, mm-hmm. you know. And it's very public and visible. Super right? public and visible. I, I'm 34 years old. I've never seen a dead body in my entire life. Not once. I've seen a few. Yeah. Well, yeah. I imagine you have your more involved, but yeah. I think many of uh, uh, Americans, many Western people mm-hmm. probably have not seen a dead body. And the irony of that is that so many of our, you know, our media and movies are like death. Yeah. Like we ironically live in this culture of death, mm-hmm. but when it comes to actual culture of death, we're far removed right. from it. Yeah, true. We we're kind of desensitized in a way mm-hmm. to death. Um, in a way that I'm not sure how to describe, but yeah, we are kind of bombarded with the idea of death and war. Like we all know, like we know about it intellectually, Mm -hmm. but like on a deeper kind of more emotional level, we're not connected to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, why are we afraid of death? Again, I think that's, it's individually, we all have our own answers. And one of my teachers Francis Weller talks about how we live in this culture of anesthesia and amnesia. So we like to numb. We, we, Mm -hmm. we don't actually like to feel the hard feelings and death brings up some really hard feelings. You know, if it's about our own or if it's about losing someone that we love, it brings up some really hard feelings. So again, this comes back to the necessity of, building a culture that can hold as complex emotions. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, in my mind, it's not one or the, it, they're, they're completely related. Mm. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. There's, um, there's an interesting development that's, um, coming about through technology that, um, it's just, it's just another, level of the manifestation of avoidance of death. But there are people who, there are people who are looking, they're, they're seeking immortality through technology Mm. is basically how you could put it. That, Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea that, I mean, robotics are coming along so quickly, um, computing and quantum computing and artificial intelligence. And, You know, it's possible that at some point we may be able to transfer our consciousness into another body. It's possible. Um, I think it's probably a lot farther off than, you know, there's a lot of science fiction movies about it coming out now. But this is certainly an idea that is um, entering the sort of public consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
that this may be possible. But I mean, why, you know, why? Yeah. It's just that, it's just that further, further avoidance and, it, um, like why, like, I don't know, I guess it depends. Like maybe a lot of people's discomfort comes from a personal belief system. Like, I mean, if you believe in reincarnation, like, yeah, whatever you believe happens to you after you die, if you go to heaven, if you're a worm food and you just cease to exist, um, I guess maybe the state of your mind and your belief about what's going to happen to you. Um, I think in general, related to death or related to anything, um, as a society, we fear a loss of control. I think we're mm -hmm. like a control obsessed society. Like everyone wants to, everyone wants to be in control of themselves and their life. And, um, <laughs> you know, people are constantly trying to control each other. Um, and that's the ultimate <clears throat> loss of control. That's something that we cannot control our own mortality. And, um, you know, I, I personally believe that whatever sense of control that we try to create in our lives is so minimal compared to the unknowns of life. And that I, I think a lot of people can try and box themselves into a highly predictable reality mm -hmm. and, um, a very safe and secure comfort zone because, you know, um, within that kind of tight existence, they're, they're, they're not as much confronted with the unknown. And so even just the unknowns that may occur in daily life, I mean, some people don't even want to travel to different places and stuff like that, you know? So, I mean, or how a different way to work or, or, yeah, you know, they just, um, they find comfort in predictability and they cling to it. Right. But so, I mean, gosh, like how can death possibly find a place within that, that thought sphere? You mm. Know? Mm. I think preparing for it, mm -hmm. honestly. And I, I think that's the, the irony of the situation is I think the more we talk about it, mm -hmm. the more we'll get comfortable with it. We'll have a clear map in our head of what, what do I want when I'm dying? You mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. and, and be real if, oh, wow, I'm having a lot of anxiety talking about my death, like knowing how to follow that if, mm -hmm. if, if it's evoking anxiety or talking with your family members about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I mean, looking at the funeral industry, it's, it's insane how corpses are filled with these crazy toxic chemicals like formaldehyde, mm -hmm. which makes funeral... <laughs> workers sick you know <laughs> like, yeah like morticians are and also terror i mean you put if you're putting those people into the ground oh yeah yeah you're putting chemicals into the ground that leach into the groundwater exactly exactly and then a lot of these uh cemeteries it's like cement vaults that these boxes these caskets are made from like mahogany and other like endangered wood and these caskets are like you know six thousand dollars yeah and it's just like crazy. the whole thing is really insane and just to put a body that's being preserved to slow down the decomposition process it's like they're you're in a closed box below the ground like who who cares if it takes longer for you to decompose it's just that whole disconnect to nature i think that's actually the core of like why we're so afraid of death mm we're a lot of us don't know where our food comes from and we're disconnected from the natural cycles of life we're don't know how to build our own fires we're drinking water that's been messed with <laughs> sure you know for me i I, th I think that's actually that's my answer of why we're so afraid of death is because we've actually become really disconnected with the elements mm -hmm. <laughs> straight up yeah yeah, I yeah, I think we're really disconnected from life as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's this there's this saying to uh 
that you die the way that you live. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people, the way that they lived, is totally reflective in the way that they die. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, I think I'll have a great death. Yeah, (laughs) me too. (laughs) Me too. I want to, I want to really fully explore this life, you know, and I, I, I don't want to be limited. I I don't want, I don't want my experience to, I don't want to be confined by the boundaries of my own fear. And we all have fear, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think those who try to posture like, Oh, I'm not afraid of anything. And it's like, I think everyone's afraid of something. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's just a matter of whether you allow that, whether you cross that boundary or not. And I think the more that we cross that boundary in life, the more that we're willing to, to challenge ourselves and to, to expand and to grow. Well, like I was talking about in the psychedelic experience, I mean, it's that spiritual or emotional weightlifting and you come out of it stronger. Uh, and when you exercise your, when you're challenged to find that internal strength to meet the present reality of um, a psychedelic experience, then um, it gives me more courage in life as well. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like some ayahuasca ceremonies I've had that have been really challenging. I mean, coming back from that and returning to my normal life, it's like, I mean, what, whatever I might've complained about before is like, Oh, that's nothing. I Mm -hmm. got this. If I got through that, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perspective. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you've lived a life facing up to your fears and finding that, that courage and finding that deep well of strength that I think every single person has, then I think the prospect of, of death and the unknown is like, I have, I have a confidence. I think maybe the reason I am more comfortable with death personally is I have a level of confidence in myself that whatever, that when I come up against the unknown that I'm going to do well. And if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. I mean, I don't, then I don't know, whatever. Like if I cease to exist, then that's just what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But if there is a realm of bardos and, um, you know, yeah, um, after death, DMT, (laughs) endless dreams, psychedelic landscape, I have a confidence in myself that I will be able to navigate that, you know, because... Mm -hmm. I've done, I've already done so in, in some way, you know, I've been training, not like Tibetan monks train, but in my own way, Mm -hmm. you know, of just coming up against more difficult situations. Um, have you heard of this, this, this book that Timothy Leary wrote called The Psychedelic Experience. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you have, it's, um, so back in the 60s, Timothy Leary and I think his name is Richard, Richard Alpert, who later became Ram Dass. And there were all these like uh, Harvard scholars who were teachers and academics and they began taking LSD and experimenting and um, going really, really far out and like doing high doses of LSD and like locking themselves into a house and not coming out for four days and just getting absolutely as high as they possibly could and going to the full heights of heaven and the depths of hell and Mm. documenting their experiences and discussing it and speaking publicly. And there was... They were a large part of the, um, an outspoken part of the psychedelic revolution in the sixties. But at some point they discovered 
I think Leary himself discovered the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And he was reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead about what happens after you, what they say, what happens after you die. And he noticed that that was almost exactly his experiences on LSD. Mm. That um, many, that this, the stages of death were the stages of the psychedelic experience, like very, very closely. And he was fascinated by this. Hmm. So he ended up writing a psychedelic handbook, which is called The Psychedelic Experience, uh, published in 1966. And it's a psychedelic handbook adapted from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Hmm. And um, just as the <clears throat> Tibetans read the Book of the Dead, um, to guide the spirits through the bardos. Um, this is a handbook to like guide the guide a person through like a really deep psychedelic experience. <laughs> I'm pretty trippy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, earlier I was talking about, I feel like shamanism is, well, shamanism is also pretty foreign, I think to our mainstream American culture, but for me personally, I feel like that those realms are what get me most in touch with that kind of deep subconscious or whatever, whatever is there beyond um, normal waking reality, mm -hmm. you know, the dream state, the psychedelic state, or perhaps the death state. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so... I don't know. In a way, I feel like maybe, maybe I'm getting inadvertent death training, also life training too, though. Absolutely, yeah. And that's not the only way, of course. Yeah. That's that's just been a way that I've explored um, the shamanic experience. But absolutely, yeah. And it's it's beautiful to be to be alive. Yeah. To even talk about. As humans, right? Mm -hmm. You know, do do birds sit around and talk about like, when do you think I'm gonna die? There's just the ability to even contemplate the end, mm -hmm. and just how humans have a really different relationship with with death, yeah, than other creatures. Not, I mean, that's true. That's something that um, most people also don't talk about just the very fact that we exist and mm -hmm. um, how did we even come to be and the deep existential nature of the human experience mm -hmm. and the fact that we're awake and that we can we can communicate complex ideas through these systems of uh, noises that we've developed <laughs> and <laughs> s s uh, scribbled symbols mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's all part of the, the greater arc of evolution, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's where the question of death is even more on our own soul evolution. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also part of that puzzle that we may never know. Yeah. We may never know what happens until it actually happens. Right. You know, and until that day. And I think that also, like, um, releasing our need to control or releasing a need to know and just um, it's difficult i think to embrace embrace the unknown mm -hmm. and to just be like well you know i i mean we know even even our collective knowledge as an entire species is so minuscule compared to to what there is to know i mean we don't we really do not understand the nature of our own consciousness. Yeah. Um, like scientists have been looking where, where is, what's the part that makes us awake? Mm -hmm. Where is our sentience? And this is why I don't, this is personally why I don't think that we're anywhere close to artificial and sent to sentient artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't even understand our own consciousness and sentience. So if you want to build a computer that replicates what we do, well, first you have to understand how we work 
and they're looking in the brain, they're looking for the mechanism of consciousness. But I think that it's not necessarily contained within the body. And we're still facing a scientific taboo around things of a spiritual nature, um, which I don't think that consciousness and the soul are necessarily have to be relegated to spirituality. Mm, um, I, agree. I, I feel like it's an aspect of reality. It's not mm -hmm. supernatural. It's natural. Mm -hmm. Now I wouldn't know how to get that to register on a scientific instrument. Um, but I've had, you know, personal experiences at least that aren't proof, but that are at least convincing to me. And I think that, we're so far away from being able, unless unless we kind of humble ourselves and maybe we can draw some inspiration and some clues from other cultures that have been around for thousands of years and maybe, you know, um, consider that they're not um, primitive, um, superstitious people but that maybe they've actually learned some things over uh, having a sustained culture of thousands of years, that maybe they have something to say about death and the nature of life and reality, that maybe that can give us some clues to explore scientifically. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of that is happening, but there's like a giant gateway that needs to be opened. So um, I kind of wonder if, like I think if artificial, sentient artificial intelligence does come about, I imagine it's probably going to happen in a different country that is more open to that's has a greater awareness of actually the nature of consciousness mm -hmm. and less, less of sort of a fixed narrow mindset of mechanistic reality that, um, we kind of hold in the West. I imagine that, um, you know, other, other countries are probably going to make more progress, but that's just my personal <laughs> guess, you know? <laughs> Probably the Chinese. Yeah, probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah. It, I don't pretend like I know. Yeah. No idea mm -hmm. where we're going in that realm. Mm -hmm. I'm more focused on like, how do we just handle with w what we've got now, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which actually brings, this might be opening a lot, but why suicide to me is such it's such a fascinating and it like gets to that core of like the human experience and just what recently happened um did you know about that event did you hear I about did. it uh -huh. yeah and um or did you know her she actually was at i didn't think i knew her until i had this very clear flashback of her doing the shamanic cheerleader skit at the shamanic cabaret mm-hmm uh, it was a birthday party I had a few years ago. Oh, yeah. I kind of remember. Yeah. I didn't go to that, but I remember you having that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really, it hit me full on when I, when I had that memory. And that's when I was able to really go into the enormity of, uh, of that situation, how her choice has deeply affected a lot of people mm. and the ripples that her life and death have created. Mm -hmm. And also this almost conversation with her spirit about, you know, being, being conscious enough to make, to make that choice. Mm -hmm. And it kind of contradicts everything that we've been saying thus far about like, you know, like she had control which is just, I'm so curious about like, wow, like, so that's a soul, that's a soul's, that's a soul's choice, mm -hmm. you know? And like that really, really hard spot of just grieving how tragic it is and also having to respect like that is a soul's choice and like doing everything we can to not allow somebody to get that, that point. But also when that does occur, sending uh, uh, the most love that we possibly can mm -hmm. to that person. Mm -hmm. And that was a big focus of the 
of the gathering of the vigil yeah, yeah vigil that's the word i was looking for is more of a vigil than anything else um it really was in it was in support of the community but also really in support of the the departed yeah. spirit and there was definitely a focused kind of like um and actually there were some some people there that I didn't know personally, but that were clearly connected to like Tibetan traditions. Mm. And there was, a, there was, I don't, I don't know that much about tr Tibetan traditions to know if it was kind of more of a Western take or if it was more true to tradition or what, but there was certainly like a lot of um, Tibetan symbolism and tools and um, philosophy mm -hmm. uh, present in the vigil and in the guidance of the vigil and yeah focused on sending kind of like intentional love and support to the to her departed soul disembodied spirit to um to make her way yeah peacefully mhm mm mhm mm um so i wanted to know more about your experience as a death doula and guiding or supporting people who are actively dying. Um, how I'm curious really to know like what, what does that feel like to be around someone who's dying? And I'll give a little bit of context for my curiosity to know more because I had two friends who uh, were doing hospice care for a dying man. Or he, he, he was uh, he was definitely old and sick and on his way towards death, but still moving around and talking and things like that. And he needed help, right? But at a certain point, he started to get much more ill. And my friend, two of my friends were present for his death, and. Um, something something changed in him where obviously he was he seemed to be very kind of like barely there like um not dead but more ethereal you could say just mm -hmm. just leaving or something like that and so they called um the i don't know they called somebody who like the organization I think that they worked through mm -hmm. and um, they were volunteers or were they hospice and they were living hospice living. caretakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the person they, they were describing what was happening cause they didn't actually know. They didn't know like, Oh, this is a death process, but that's what the person on the phone said. They're like, Oh, he's dying. Mm -hmm. Like that's, he's entering the death stages. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because I didn't even know that there was like the, sh the person on the phone w was clear. I was like, oh yeah, like there are these certain things that signal that a person is starting to die, mm -hmm. that it's not just like, oh, they're sick and they'll recover, but like they're, they're actively dying. They're going to die really soon. Mm -hmm. And I was totally unaware that there were these kind of, um, that there was this this shift or transition of kind of like energy that would signal someone's starting to die. So I'm curious if you know more specifics about what that what that looks like. What are some of those signs, and um, what are the kind of stages of of uh, that a person goes through leading up to death? Well, again, it depends on how long the person has been sick. Um, the kinds of medications that they're still taking towards the end. And I'll just speak from my experience of being with my mom, who her process, it was fascinating. They, 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 we thought that she was going to die two weeks before that she did because she started to show those initial signs of being really out of it, super spacey, just not in her body whatsoever. And then she had these two days of being incredibly lucid and actually aware and 
and it was kind of like the final stretch mm. of like I'm alive and I'm here and we none of us had seen her like that in like mm. a while mm-hmm. and then it was after that that it's it's actually the disillusion of elements like that's how I've learned it mm. is that the elements in your body start to break down you know first it's like a lack of movement um you're not able to drink water anymore um you probably they probably haven't eaten in days either Mm -hmm. and it's better towards the end to actually not feed a person because Mm -hmm. it actually can create just more suffering Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. just accepting the natural process that is occurring Mm -hmm. and a lot of times people are incontinent towards the end Mm -hmm. and not able to hold their urine or bowel movements Mm -hmm. um and that's when the process of the air within the body starts to really break down and so are you saying before the air starts to break down there's another element that is starting to break down or i'm not i'm not sure about like there's there's not the same order i don't think it's the same order like every time but yeah you can you can track like oh because the the Tibetans talk about this too. They talk about that um, as a person is dying. They s- said precisely what you just said, that the mm-hmm. elements start to break down. Mm-hmm. They talk about four elements mm-hmm. and that the four elements of the body start to collapse in on themselves and that it um, it brings about a heaviness of experience and that um, the person is very weak like not responsive or maybe totally unresponsive but that there still is an awareness and the sensitivity to sound Mm -hmm. and that um but they feel like they're being they're being crushed by mountains there it's just Mm. they're in such like a heavy sleepy just just like under piles and piles of dirt or something like that unable to move Yeah, and the breath becomes really heavy, mm. loud. Mm-hmm. Really, <laughs> really loud. Yeah, and a lot of times eyes open, mm. and you can tell. You can tell that it's happening. Mm-hmm. And that they're more or less in between in between worlds mm. and just holding on to those those final elements that make humans embodied, like the air, like the breath. Mm-hmm. And at that point, yeah, usually that's after the the final breath is taken, that's when the body firms up really fast. That's what's crazy. Is that like once, once the final breath is gone, it's like, doesn't take long for rigor mortis to settle in. How long? I want to say like two hours, two hours. Wow. Let's fact, fact check that one. Oh, okay. (laughs) But uh, it's soon. It's definitely soon. That's, Uh that's why it's like, if if you want to tend to a body after they pass and, you know, give a, a sweet bath and just like clean the body up before either giving, you know, bringing it to a funeral home or having the morgue come. Um, or if you do choose to do a home funeral, it's, it's important to take care of that, you know, with in a timely manner and mm. get them positioned and, have things prepared mm-hmm. and because they'll just stiffen up and you can't really move them as yeah 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 that's wild i i don't know really much about rigor mortis like do you know why does the body why does the body do that well just again stiffen it's, up? it's 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 like we're we're made of water right mm. and then it's like after after we die like all these elements like I guess like we just return back to I guess after your blood stops pumping all that fluid stops moving it just sort of like solidifies 
Yeah. Like like how blood coagulates as like when you have an open wound and it just mm. kind of stiffens up maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't know much. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know either. I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe that's why. But Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then is there, so they're open eyed and breathing loudly and then, like, um, is there any change from that when death occurs? Is there kind of like a slowing down or do they just have like a final breath? And then, or in the case of your mom, were you there actually at the moment that your mom died? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was lying right next to her mm-hmm. and yeah, it, it was that one final breath and then she was gone and her her dog actually her small dog like jumped on the bed right after the last breath it was crazy Hmm. and it was like the dog knew when the soul or or just when that last breath happened it was and the amount of energy i felt after my mom passed initially was just this surge of i felt this freedom i Hmm. felt that she was finally free from her suffering and she was free from this body that had caused quite a bit of pain mm-hmm. towards the end. And I remember learning on a trip when I was I was in India, when I was in college, from these Tibetan monks that, you know, when you die, I love this analogy of when you die, it's like this ball of confetti that gets thrown all of your layers of karma are like these, you know, flakes of confetti that are coming off. But ultimately there's that, that center, that essence that's just continuing, propelling you towards your next life. Hmm. And I always really loved that imagery. And I definitely felt that Mm -hmm. when my mom had passed and really felt these different layers and still on like the anniversary of her passing, I, I feel her spirit really close Mm-hmm. Uh, around day of the dead i definitely feel her presence and do my best to communicate with her but you know let her be free and do what she needs to do and, mm-hmm. and also acknowledge that uh yeah i don't know what form she's in now mm-hmm. however how i can reconnect to her is connecting to the the memory of the love that she gave me mm-hmm. and and also acknowledge back to your question too, is that everyone, it's like birth too, mm. you know, one of my, another one of my teachers talks about how birth and death are, you know, it's like the same thing, but like this revolving door and every one of us has a different birth story, you know, not mm. one death is going to be the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So someone might pass in their sleep and have really quiet breathing. Mm-hmm. Someone might pass in a really, sudden Mm -hmm. peaceful way some people might have more trouble letting go Mm -hmm. and surrendering just again i think it just depends on how much do you talk about it how comfortable you're with it who's who's by your bedside yeah you know and and that's that's (sighs) it's beautiful if people can have have like know that they want to die at home and can choose that. I certainly would. I wouldn't want to die in a freaking hospital. I'll tell you that much. Well, a lot of people do. Yeah, I would. A wouldn't. lot of people die in hospitals. A lot of people die in nursing homes. Mm-hmm. People. <laughs> yeah, people die ev- everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know that uh, two people die per second somewhere on the earth. Revolving door. And, but four people are born. Are born a second. Well, then that gets us into a whole other conversation of like, okay, so where are these souls coming from? Because it's like there are more of us on the planet now than there ever has been, you know? So are these, and if reincarnation is true. They're space invaders. Space invaders, different dimensions, you know, are these souls like splitting into two? Bodhisattvas are just, you know, spontaneously showing up. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, who knows? Maybe there is just in a giant soul collective up there in the astral realm of, uh, and you know, um, 
you know, who, I don't know. Well, actually I keep going back to the Tibetans because I watched, I, <laughs> I, I ha, have known about that for a while, but I just watched a documentary in, um, oh, pre- which one? in preparation for this, just a YouTube documentary on the Tibetan book of the dead. Oh, really? So I got, I just wanted to get reacquainted with what they talk about um, yeah, thanks, before this podcast. But. Thanks for uh, bringing it up again. Cause I was actually reading Tibetan book of the dead while my mom was passing and I was, 22 and i remember i was like god this is so dense you know it's 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 definitely a lot of Mm. information and also feeling this energy of comfort Mm -hmm. knowing that there was that guide almost or Mm -hmm. that there was a group of, of humans that have poured that amount of energy to understanding this passage yeah you know it was it was actually really comforting right so that's cool that you watched it before this yeah, I just, I know that there's so much depth there and I wanted to have it kind of at the tip of my mind to be able to weave in as was appropriate and um, it's coming in a lot, which is good. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, from from their perspective, they actually say, because in our culture, you know, a lot of people say like, go towards the light, right? Like go towards the light. They actually say, um, don't go towards the light, which <laughs> I remember. which I thought was so interesting. And I actually wrote down a little um, piece of the this documentary that I listened to. It said, "Do not follow the soft white light. Um, you may become ensnared in the temporary pleasures of being born as a god." Mm. living in lordly ignorance of the passage of time yet subject to unexpected death and the tibetans talk about these um heavenly realms and mm-hmm. yeah they're they're all of you could call them other dimensions i don't know the appropriate actual term for them but they they're other sort of realms of consciousness and they actually talk about the that basically in order for to reach like full liberation that um you actually want to reincarnate that mm-hmm. um it's in order to like learn the less the soul lessons required to reach enlightenment you have to be embodied and that uh, the body vehicle is like essential for that that sort of process i guess and um that you if you go up to if you follow the white light and go into these heavenly realms you can you can end up there for a long long time and but that eventually you have to come back down you like have to fall back down from there into back into another incarnation and that um after death you want to go straight back into your next life rather than like avoid it by you know going up so i thought that was oh, super, come on. super who doesn't interesting. want to hang out in the god realms for just I like know. a little bit a couple I don't know. thousand years i mean you know yeah <laughs> sounds nice well i've i've definitely had that uh, thought process how maybe it's not in in different dimensions but it really is all playing out on human earth you know the god realms are really just the one percent who own everything <laughs> <laughs> And the, or I or think, there might be the hungry ghosts, you know. Yeah, I think some of those people suffer the most, actually. Well, yeah. 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 They have abundant opportunities to avoid themselves, mm-hmm. right, and distract themselves. Yeah, and I mean, the the con- same concept of, like, if we're going to go to the Judeo-Christian model. I actually don't know much about what Jewish culture believes with the afterlife i mean i was raised catholic so i definitely had that deep conditioning of heaven or hell Mm -hmm. just just like it's so simple it's so simplified like what really Mm -hmm. you really you really think it's like good forever or bad forever it's like let's be a little bit more creative Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i i don't know but I've been to a hell-like realm in an ayahuasca ceremony, and um, oh, me too. 
Uh huh. <laughs> it's unpleasant to Super say the least. Gnarly. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly for sure. It's a good word. Um, yeah, there's, and I don't claim to know what those even are, and I, I don't have a fixed idea of what they are. Uh, I had I had full experiences, and I've been to like heavenly realms too mm-hmm. in um, ayahuasca experiences, and I just kind of take those experiences for what they are, and I don't, I try not to like go into my mind about it of like and try and make sense of it, you know, and try to go back into that kind of control mechanism of like, oh, I know what's going on. But nevertheless, you know, I I had experiences of what I've what yeah, just um the mind the mind manifest and um the the demons of the mind manifest. Hmm. And um uh, one one time I lift lifted up out of my body and um, I had this strange experience where I was meditating. It was actually after the ceremony had ended and I, I had I had a really deep and purgative ceremony and I had puked a lot and just cleared a ton of negative energy out of myself during the ceremony. And afterward I felt super light and super purified and I was just sitting in this really gentle easy meditation that just came about effortlessly I just felt I wasn't even trying to meditate I just felt so good and just closed my eyes and um I was super sensitive to like I was just really open and I could hear the sound, which is best described as angel, the sound of angels singing. It sounded like a chorus of angels, literally. Mm. And it was, it sounded like it was coming from up above my head. Um, but more so in the astral space, not the physical space. And I was curious about it. I was like, oh, what's that? And I just kind of was able to gently lift up out of my body and as I as my consciousness lifted out from kind of my eye level of my head and lifted up out of my head the singing got louder and I lifted up maybe a foot maybe two feet above the top of my head where I could feel like I'm not in my body right now. I could feel where my body was, but, Mm. and I'm just going towards the singing, which just sounded like a thousand or more angels singing in perfect harmony. And there was this threshold that I passed through and I could, I could see, and I was in this like aqueous medium and there was, um, kind of these, these grid lines like you might see in Alex Gray paintings. There was this grid that stretched stretched to infinity. And I, I was basically in sort of like a void space, like like infinite space. And um, I was in, I w- was then surrounded by the sound of the, this, this sound, this like primordial sound that felt like it had always existed and will always exist. Mm. And it was like being, it was like being in water and it was, it brought me just like huge relief and, um, but then, and I was just in my pure experience of it. And then I had a thought, I was like, wow. And as soon as I thought something, I dropped back down through that threshold and I was back into the realm of mind and I realized I was like I was like whoa like I and then I went under this process of kind of relaxing and just lifting up again but as soon as I had a thought I would fall back out of there and that realm wherever I went to was a realm of no mind Mm. like thought did not exist there or at least that was my experience Mm -hmm. that, um, it, it's a, it's a realm beyond, beyond mind and thought, which is the state of consciousness that most of us embody almost all of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the state of consciousness I 
always embody except for those few moments in that one experience where I lifted out of the realm of mind Hmm. and you know I don't know maybe there's some tradition somewhere that that talks about what that place is I don't know Hmm. Um, but yeah we know we know so little about who we are and what we are and, and what exists beyond our our normal state um i'm compelled to explore Mm -hmm. you know and that's what that's part of the the value that i or that's part of what what brings me to explore these topics and to explore my consciousness through psychedelic ceremonies or meditation or yoga or i'd like to get into lucid dreaming but just just a curiosity of like who are we really Mm -hmm. and what's what's beyond all of the surface layer that you know most of us just we just go about our lives not considering it which is fine and i do that a lot too yeah but i like exploring (laughs) and trying to bring something back to Mm -hmm. share Mm -hmm. you know yeah because ultimately we are all doing this human thing Mm -hmm. and we all learn from each other we can learn from each other Mm -hmm. and especially in these different states of consciousness it is incredibly important that we have others that we can integrate these experiences with Mm -hmm. so we don't get lost in (laughs) those other realms because we're here you know yeah we're here totally yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I talk a lot about psychedelic integration and the mm-hmm. importance of that because there's certainly, I've certainly seen and tapped into it myself too, a sense of escapism that can come from exploring those realms and right. yeah, just wanting, wanting to escape the kind of uh, everyday mundane grind mm-hmm. and suffering of the human experience. So it's important, I think, to to always come back. And so, um, well, we're coming to a close. Is there anything that you, uh, that we haven't talked about that you wanted to discuss? Um, and uh, also, is there anything that you want to offer to people, any resources you have or, yeah any any closing thoughts Mm, well thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this topic uh it's one i imagine i will be talking about till the day i die Mm -hmm. and yeah i just want to really encourage anyone who is listening or watching to just be gentle with this topic you know if it brings stuff up for you or if it brings excitement just following the threads and being okay with talking about it with people Mm -hmm. there are a lot of resources I can give. There are quite a few books on death that I recommend. Um, and also grief work. I don't know if you want that like in notes or just, well, go, um, not everyone reads the notes. Um, so yeah, uh, go ahead and speak it and I'll put it in the notes as well. Um, okay, cool. So at first my, uh, One of my grief teachers, Francis Weller, um, he has a couple books on grief. And The Wild Edge of Sorrow is one that I really recommend. And this is a really great, like, smaller, quick read that's really helpful if you're dealing with any life transitions or want some more resources about how to bring your grief from an individual place into a more supported way. Mm. Um, And... I want to get back to you about a couple specific oh there's a really one um on dying it's a tibetan book that's like specifically about the dying process as well um, mm. that you can check out mm-hmm. and some other resources about like home funerals green burials um jerry grace lyons has she's one of my teachers she has an amazing program called final passages 
And she does a lot of education about uh, non-traditional ways of burying the dead. Okay. She's a cool. really cool resource. Awesome. Yeah. I'll put those in the show notes. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Thanks yeah, for... Yeah, super fun. Um, I, like, I like talking about... Um, well, it was, a, it was fun. For, I learned a lot in this mm. conversation too. It was fun and it was fun to just explore, explore the topic. Um, so thanks so much for being willing to, uh, be available and coming on down. Cool. Thank you, Finch. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. It feels very timely to be talking about death. I feel like death has been in the public eye and suicide has been in the public eye a lot recently. There's been several prominent suicides over the last few years and um, deaths of famous people. And, and yeah, for, like I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the episode for me, my, my friend just killing himself. And um, I don't know much of the details yet. And I haven't really wanted to know. I've just been, with my own feelings and just remembering moments with him over, over the years. And he was a special dude. He was, uh, he actually, I hadn't seen him in a while, but he reached out to me within the last month and said that he saw my episode on Burning Man and he knows both, he knows Benjamin as well. He met both of us and, uh, I invited him to come on. He's just got crazy stories and he's a just a pretty radical psychonaut himself and I feel sad that uh I'm never going to see him again and that we're never going to have that conversation on this podcast or any other conversation. He's gone from the earth. And yeah, just over the last day since I or less than 24 hours since I learned about that. I've just been thinking more deeply about suicide and how so many people are just wanting to end their lives and leave this earth. And I guess I just wanted to share a little bit about myself and I've never been suicidal, but I've struggled with depression my entire life um and i've wished for death i i've thought that to be free of my suffering felt attractive i never i knew that i didn't want to commit a violent act against myself and end my own life i knew that that's not something that i wanted to do or maybe even could do Um, but I just, there were times where I deeply yearned for a release from the pain of life. And honestly, I think that's something that's more common than is discussed. I think that a lot more people than we realize have had suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation, or for me, it was just like, I, I didn't want to exist. It's not that I wanted to kill myself. It just was like, you know, if I could just snap my fingers right now and just painlessly not exist, you know, I might, I might do that. I don't know. I don't feel like that anymore. Um, and this was like earlier in my life and I've, I figured a lot of my shit out and I'm happy to be alive now. And, but, even in the midst of those dark moments when I was having those kind of thoughts, other thoughts would come to mind and say, you know, they would just tell me, you know, what if what you're feeling right now is temporary? Like what if you end up getting through this and later in your life, in your thirties and your forties and your fifties, what if you end up having an incredible life? and you're really happy and that you know like if if you end it in that moment of pain you'll never be able to get to experience that like 
we never know what our lives are going to hold later on down the road. And sometimes I think we all can just get locked into a deep place of suffering and pain and that that's all we see. And it's hard to see any hope. And especially in the world today, it just, things feel super dark and hopeless. And I had like, um, I had an intuition years and years ago. Um, I get these kind of like, you could, I don't know what to call it, psychic premonitions if you want, but I, I could just feel this like wave of transformation coming to the earth and in society. I could see that this is when I was a teenager. So maybe in the like late nineties, early two thousands, I had this feeling and um, this term kept coming to mind, um, a revolution of consciousness. That just kept coming to mind that what that we were about to enter a revolution of consciousness, that we're about to enter this period of mass awakening on the planet. And, I, you know, I didn't know what to make of it at the moment, but I feel like I've been witnessing it unfold. But the other part of that, uh, feeling that I had was that the energy of transformation is going to be coming in and there's a tremendous amount of pressure associated with that and change is hard sometimes change is what we need but it's it can be very difficult I think to want to change willingly and I could just see that the this change this energy and transformational pressure being forced upon everyone at the same time. It's like you're just in the river and the, and the current is taking you where it will. And I could just see how not everyone is going to be able to cope with that. And I actually had the, th the thought that, um, there would be like a mass increase in suicides and suffering if people are resisting that change anyway I don't know I just I have a lot of thoughts going through my head I haven't planned out any of this of what I'm saying I'm just kind of speaking openly and um couldn't couldn't really sleep a lot last night just had a lot of thoughts in my head but I guess another thing I want to share too is that I feel tremendously hopeful for the future not only for not just, and not, I mean, I, I feel that way personally, but I feel like that societally and planetarily. And I think on the surface, things feel super, super negative. You know, a lot of people are really upset about the Trump presidency. People are upset about like global war and all kinds of things going on. Um, But I think that we are in the midst of a deep transformation. And I think that maybe beyond all the kind of like negativity of the media and everything on the surface, I think that, I don't know. I just, I just think that there, that there's a lot that we have to live for and look forward to. So I just really hope that, that people can tap into that and freaking stop killing yourselves everyone like beautiful beautiful people choosing to end their lives and it's just it's tragic and incredible so anyway love you all very much take good care of yourselves and take care of each other